It's Josh and Frankie with a couple of dumb shits. Hello, primates! You found Primus Tracks. Congratulations! At Primus Tracks on Instagram and all those other places. Primus Tracks Pod at gmail.com is the email address. There is a Facebook page called Primus Tracks. I am Josh, and of course, the other guy who talks at you in this podcast is named Frankie. Hi, Josh. Hello, fellow listeners, patrons, everybody. How's security holding up there? The Primus Tracks Pretty tight. Pretty, Pretty tight. tight. Um, <laughs> the lasers have been installed. <laughs> It is now secured behind a, a vault, so I would say I can sleep safe at night. I'm so relieved. Primates, last time you heard from us, we discussed uh, the first in a sub-series that I'm calling Frankie's Tape Collection, and we indeed discussed the first ever Primus demo tape from 1984 featuring Les Claypool, Todd Huth, and an extremely expensive for the time Lindrum machine. And we thought, let's come right back around and do it again. Frankie, uh, wheeling and dealing out there uh, in the world of tape collections and collectors, you have another shiny new toy to share with us today. I am thrilled to confirm, Josh, that I am awaiting for my Welcome to This World tape, which means that I am just one tape shy from the complete demo tape collection wow uh so you're you're building your collection out frankie now this tape we're calling welcome to this world this would be the second uh primus demo tape ever to be distributed for public consumption um and you have some literature uh, about these we, demo we tapes gotta we gotta way. emphasize yes that's right josh we gotta emphasize the fact that it's the second one in terms of public consumption yeah our Diehard listeners will be shouting right now that we are wrong. But remember that in the Todd Hooth episode, uh, the tape that Todd mentions containing song titles, which we had never heard before, based on the research that Josh and I have conducted, our conclusion is that that tape ha- was never distributed publicly. So... Les and Todd probably recorded those songs, but that tape would be the equivalent to a, an in-house promotional CD from a record label. <laughs> it's something that is never meant to be in the hands of the public at large. Yeah. So if we eliminate that mysterious tape from the equation, we got five demo tapes, which chrono- chronologically would be Primate 1984, Welcome to this world, the tape that we're about to discuss now, followed by Sucking Songs, which is the tape with the baby on the cover, followed by Primus Socks, which might not be familiar to listeners because you have not actually seen what it looks like. So that predates Patreon and the video. But what I can tell you is that it's a tape with a drawing of Skeeter on the J-card, and the, t- and the artwork is completely black. Skeeter is kind of outlined with, uh, with white colors. Um, if I remember correctly, what David mentioned in the episode is that the tape contains, do you like it? Is that correct? And Oh, yeah. And the version of John the Fisherman, which apparently is different to what would appear on Sausage a year later, which wow. is the yellow tape that we are we have all been familiar with for years. So that means Welcome to This World was the second tape ever distributed for public consumption. Mm -hmm. And we're not entirely certain about the year, whether it was 85 or 86, but we know it's one of them uh, because Peter Libby is indeed on drums. And we should should also mention this is the first Primus demo then with an actual drummer, uh, and it's Peter Libby. uh, Correct. And Peter Libby, our talk with Peter Libby is coming up right after we sample the portions of this demo. We have to thank Peter for his kindness in sending us 
uh, the digital files that you guys will get to hear samples of. At his request, we're only playing about 30 seconds of each, and we cannot share them outside of that. But these files are directly from the two-inch master tape of the Welcome to This World uh, demo recording that is in the possession of Todd Huth. So these and they are, sound and they sound superb, spectacular, spectacular, spectacular. <laughs> 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 uh, man, they do. I'm really excited to play small portions of these tunes uh, for you guys today. Definitely uh, stick around for our talk with Peter Libby. Fantastic guy. Had some great stories from the old days. Obviously, a talented drummer in his own right. He and Soya got to talk drums with us uh, and to us, and I learned a lot. In terms of distribution, Josh, I yeah. would venture to say that this tape probably follows the same protocol from Primate 84, which means distribution at concerts and probably deliveries to radio stations, right? And yeah, maybe record label executives. Yeah, uh, we do know that Prelude to Fear from the Primate demo got a little radio play in the Bay Area. And we know that from your Sucking Songs demo, that Tommy the Cat got quite a bit uh, of radio play in the Bay Area. And so I'd imagine one or two of the tunes from uh, today's demo, Welcome to This World, must have been played on the radio at some point. And once again, we are oblivious to actual numbers. Uh, there's no way of knowing how many of these tapes were made mm -hmm. and how many of them survived. But what we do know is that it's an extremely rare artifact as much as the, the rest of the demo tapes. 27. 27 made. All right. <laughs> and it's also worth highlighting that Hector is back again in the Primus lore with another appearance on the J card artwork. <laughs> yeah. This is it, another anatomical illustration. This is lifted from a classic diagram of human musculature that uh, you see in textbooks, you know, in the background, in historical dramas, in doctor's offices. And I remember seeing that very diagram in some capacity when I was younger. So it's really funny to see it show up on a Primus demo tape. I would venture to say that is probably Hector. We have no idea what happened to Louis. <laughs> he had the day off. So we're on theme, though, with diagrams of living beings for the, <laughs> for the Welcome to This World demo cover. Uh, and I believe it's the same stamp style uh, font for, for the uh, band name Primus that is also on the first demo. So they, there is some consistency there. We also have some consistency on the tape, Frankie. The introduction, uh, as you mentioned last episode, the introduction to this tape, Welcome to This World, echoes the introduction to the Primate tape with That's right. Child Knocking. Dad! Uh, and so on the first tape, we get, What's a Primate? And then we got <laughs> this one. <laughs> Kids knocking. Dad! What do you want, kid? What's a Primus? But what I really like is on this one, after, what's a Primus? He says, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> the dad lost his patience. Even nobody wanted to talk about Primus in 1985, for crying out loud, and still <laughs> nobody wants to. So uh, let's take a look at this tape, Frankie. We have five tracks the names of which will be immediately familiar. Welcome to this world. To defy the laws of tradition. Pressmen. Riddles are abound tonight. And is it luck? We knew about Welcome to this world from Todd Huth's Todd appearance. Huth interview. Yeah, Todd Huth and his uh, appearance on a radio program in 2019, uh, in which he discussed the sausage New Year's Eve, his, his musical career. But he also brought a whole bunch of different tracks uh, from his career. And he brought this demo version of Welcome to This World, which, of course, immediately made its way to YouTube. But the other thing that we knew from clues on records such as Frizzle Fry, Sailing the Seas of Cheese, was that these some of these other tunes, like To Defy the Laws of Tradition, uh, had their roots with Todd Huth because the guitar melodies were credited to him. I don't believe Pressman was credited to Todd because Larry played a different melody 
uh, on pork soda. Uh, it's also worth highlighting that if you look up live versions of Is It Luck from the early shows, they had a coda. They had an outro for the song when they performed it live, Ooh. where they would like speed up the tempo. And that is absent from the demo recording. Oh, so they were already messing around with format live. That's great. Yes. <laughs> So welcome to this world. Some of you have probably heard the demo version that's out there on YouTube from 2019, uh, from Todd sharing it in 2019. But just for continuity, we're going to play a little bit of that for you. So if you want to hear the whole thing, YouTube is your friend, but we will sample a couple small parts. Welcome to this world. Hey! Hey! Uh, what stands out to me, Frankie, Peter Libby's shuffle on the drums makes this song so different. Uh, once again, it's it's difficult not to listen to it with fresh ears in the sense of I'm continuously listening to it through the lens of what it appears as on Pork Soda. The shuffle that Peter's playing is fantastic, though, for the tune, as it is on this uh, tape, but it's very different. The riff... Speaking of, speaking oh, of Pork Soda, the breakdown is completely different as well, radically different. Right. So that, that bridge, that breakdown that you know and love on Pork Soda, it's not present on this tape i'll play i'll play a portion of that momentarily less's bass riff is there it's very interesting that he wrote it and initially recorded it on his four string todd's guitar part i just wrote in my notes todd's part is awesome i think i'm borrowing from somebody who commented on the youtube post that it sounds like they invented psycho billy it is it really is in that vein uh, and so credit to the person who made that observation, because it has that quality to it. I think Todd's guitar part is massively interesting. And I think you're going to hear that through this tape. As opposed to what we heard on Primate, first of all, drummer and bass player, human drummer and bass player interacting uh, and composing together, but also Todd playing more contrast uh, and playing lines that contrast what Les is doing. I think there's more of a unison riff on this on Pork Soda, and there's nothing wrong with that. Todd does something different here. Just listening to that part, Frankie, Les's voice is much more confident, and I think he's starting to find the way in which he's going to deliver his vocals going forward. Agreed. There's also a part I didn't play, Frankie, where uh, we we learned, or I learned, you already knew this, but you didn't share with me ahead of time, and therefore I was embarrassed that the Riddles Are Abound Tonight riff opening lick is based on the Woody Woodpecker laugh. Yes. There's also a bit of a half laugh, half yell that Les does early in this track that also kind of sounds like the Woody Woodpecker because he goes, he gives a little, <laughs> but it's not <laughs> up there like Woody Woodpecker. It's just his normal voice. I could be reading too much into it, but it sounds like Woody to me. Let's hear a bit of that breakdown. Peter's good, by the way. <laughs> this is cool. Well, guys, compromise is not the plan that I despise, but those who stick their hands into your game. Well, if I had a dime for each time that I had a reach, well, I'd have put the thoughts upon my brain. <laughs> if I had a dime, what Peter's doing underneath is pretty great. A completely different atmosphere in this one, of course, than what you hear on Pork Soda. And it's it has to do with recording equipment and how they set up instrumentation and the room itself, everything that goes into it. This one, less... I, I believe it's less straightforward, sinister 
than its brother. This one, a little goofier. What strikes me about this one is that um, when you listen to Welcome to This World on Pork Soda, it's a great track. Of course, it's a, it's a standout track, but I, I mean this in the kindest way possible. <laughs> it's just another track on Pork Soda. It's just another great track out of a collection of great tracks. But on this tape, on this tape, I believe the song is more of a statement. The fact that it's what title to the tape, yeah. the fact that it's the opening track on the tape, I think that emphasizes a lot more the sentiment on the lyrics. I take it as partly less talking about the world in general, but also kind of talking about the world of Primus, like come to the shows, right? Buy the tapes, check out this band, <laughs> and welcome to this world. Yeah. Because they were doing something completely unique. And yeah. on like we mentioned, unlike what other bands were playing at the time. So I think on the tape, Welcome to This World is more powerful in terms of the statement that it tries to make. Ah, yeah, as an opener, and yeah. with different lyrics, too. So the message is going to be received differently uh, with all those changes in context. And then you contrast it with the next track, To Defy the Laws of Tradition. So the first <laughs> the first track is Welcome to This Strange World. And the second track is We Don't Do Things Like Other People. <laughs> or exactly. what happens <laughs> if we do break these unwritten rules um, and of course, we've delved into the lyrics of each of these tracks uh, when we discussed their official studio releases. This one is so interesting to me uh, because for years, hearing this as a track on Frizzle Fry and hearing how Tim Alexander played it, especially with that hi-hat pattern that he's using throughout, I always thought this was a Jay Lane track and, it, and Tim is playing Jay's line. And that is not the case. This is a Peter Libby drum line. Uh, Tim Alexander adapted it, of course, to his own style and through the filter of his brain and hands and everything else. However, Peter is is playing something here that Tim interpreted, which I thought was a Jay Lane drum lick. Sounds pretty familiar. There's a couple of things that Tim Alexander changed, of course, and I think the most pronounced difference between this, what we just heard, and what appears on Frizzle Fry is that those two strokes that Les takes at the end of the phrase, bum, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba the drums really follow that more on Frizzle Fry, whereas uh, Peter is sticking with that drum groove. And, and that's uh, making it a bit more danceable, one of those little things, but it does change uh, how we're listening to it, especially as people who know the studio versions of these tracks inside and out. There are also, by the way, lots of cool drum fills throughout. Peter really brings it on this track. Todd's uh, guitar line is almost verbatim as Larry plays it on Frizzle Fry and throughout the years. Uh, so this one had a pretty established structure and they largely took it into the studio for frizzle fry with them there are some little differences uh in the arrangement the, the guitar solo doesn't appear right after the bridge they actually do about 16 bars of the main riff and then then they're into it <laughs> so and there's a couple other things that are different the finger picked intro is really fast on this demo version too Less is going a million miles an hour compared to what he how he did it on Frizzle Fry. So there's a lot of little things. But this one is largely there and and would hold its structure. So they so he must have been pretty happy with it. What's hitting your ears? 
what I immediately picked up from this one is that unlike the rest of the tracks we have heard, it didn't change that much in terms of the of the studio version that we would get further down the line. I mean, um, like you mentioned, there are details here and there, but essentially the track is there. And, and the other thing to note is that uh, Les's bass is not as articulated uh, as it would be on Frizzle Fry and, and really pushed to the front. Uh, the guitar tone obviously is much cleaner than what we would hear on uh, Frizzle Fry. So those, those things yeah. all make it more of a groovy uh, number than a, than a kind of that, uh, you know, as they were termed, thrash funk, that more aggressive uh, approach. So fascinating to hear these from 1985 or six, and, and knowing that they were pretty much fully formed. Todd was playing it every night. Peter was playing these tunes every night. Uh, Jay Lane was picking up a few of them and playing them, uh, among other drummers that would go through that revolving door uh, before Tim Alexander locked it down for a number of years. Frankie, you have to remind me, on the demo tape label for the track listing, is it Pressman or The Pressman? There's no label on the tape. <gasps> so we don't know if it's actually the Pressman yeah. or Pressman. Damn. The tracks were actually recognized by playing the tape because the J card does not state any track list, nor, do, nor does the tape have a label. It does have Primus, yeah. but that's it. Oh, so it's counterfeit. <laughs> <laughs> so that mystery lingers. Pressman or the Pressman, no matter which you choose, you'll hear something familiar in this iteration. I wanted to play the verse uh, because Todd is making cool sounds. He's laying that template for how to play guitar in Primus. And I, of course, Larry picked it up so well and fits so well in later years when he uh, entered the fray there. Les's vocal delivery is a little looser. The bass line is there. Uh, Peter is playing with rhythms and uh, that, of course, Tim Alexander is going to interpret it differently. But Peter's Those playing notes. with yeah, he's playing with these rhythms, and Peter has the space to do it. So he's he's hitting, you know, rims. He's hitting bells. He's hitting all kinds of stuff, as opposed to Tim, who's largely sticking to the toms on the studio version uh, and making it sound huge and roomy uh, with the the light touch on the toms throughout the the verses uh, that you hear in Pork Soda. I want to play a portion of the heavy part, uh, because this is startlingly different and, in my opinion, pretty damn cool. That is sinister. That is really cool. So Todd is playing that dissonant line, uh, and he just contrasts less. Even with that clean tone, it sounds heavy. And he's contrasting Les's uh, bass line so well. Once again, Peter's approach is quite different. And in that part, it, it really feels like he's conveying more of a ticking clock than the thumping that we get from Tim Alexander. You know, that pulse is beating louder now part. You know, Tim is really beaten and thumping on things, uh, and Peter's more like a ticking clock in my imaginary. Yeah. And we didn't play that part. The pulse is beating loud enough, but it is wild. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, the, the hard part of only being able to sample portions of the tracks is I can't play them all. I can't play every cool part, but I, I wanted everybody to get an idea of what these tracks sounded like as far as comparing them to uh, those studio versions because they're largely intact. They're largely here, still significant changes. I really like this version of Pressman. I'm liking all these so far. I can see why this tape assisted in their continued rise in the Bay Area here, Frankie. You gotta play the intro to Riddles, please. <laughs> 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 
This is another one, Frankie. We we knew Riddles had to have some kind of demo treatment. It showed up again on the Sausage record in 94, which indicated that uh, Todd and Les had that in their back pocket for a while. They brought it back for the Sausage release. Yeah, they should have kept that. That kicks ass. Yeah, <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> Once again, the little contrast that Todd helps provide. He's he's thinking uh, with, about harmony. He's thinking about melody. Les's phrasing is more or less the same as you hear on the Sausage record. Todd is finding those little moments to make harmonies, um, especially at weird intervals. And it sounds <laughs> badass right there. That is something I wish they would have kept for the Sausage record. That is a golden moment, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Let's move forward to uh, a little over a minute into the tune. I'll play about 20, 25 seconds here so you guys can hear what this tune sounded like way back in 85. They cut my sword. Uh, yeah. So everybody's favorite vocal part is in there, Frankie. Do you want to give us, Do you want to give us one? <laughs> I don't think I'm ready for that. <laughs> I'll do it. Hut! Hi! There you go. <laughs> Something Peter is doing in in the drum line here is he's doing a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So there's that like eighth note difference in what he's playing uh, on the on the snare, right? So he's giving it on the and. You'll notice Frankie uh, less sang, well, I'm using the term sang loosely. He says, uh, if they cut my soul in two, no mention of pie. Yeah. Why do you, what, what do you think precipitated that change? Maybe to make the track less sinister? <laughs> I suppose <laughs> so. I mean, cut my soul in two is an interesting uh, image. An interesting thought, but he clearly at some point thought better of it and decided to go with this pie. And so we've heard a couple of samples of Les's vocals in this time period, and he's kind of singing or delivering vocals the the way that he did in the first two tracks. And of course, on the Sausage record, he's much more off the microphone and a bit more mumbly, whereas here he's just straight ahead. Todd's lick is a little different too, Frankie. And not yes. fully formed like it is on the Sausage record, but I. But but still, but still complex. That that really fast strum that he does is really fun. That's a fun little thing Todd does. Throughout the track, there are many key differences, especially uh, what they do in lieu of a guitar solo on this one. There's no solo on this demo track, Frankie. They do something else, and I'll give you guys a clue. There are a lot of repetitions of. Hut! And Frankie, the demo recording ends with a wild-ass track. Is it luck? You guys thought it was nuts on Sailing the Seas of Cheese. You are correct. This is Is It Luck on a hamster wheel and ketamine. I don't know, Frankie. Let's, let's just listen to <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's got that cartoon vibe to it that we mentioned earlier. Frankie, the, the first word I wrote in my notes upon listening to this tune closely was in all caps and it was simply what period oh Peter What? Fast. That's that's the only thing that I can say. That is fast. So Todd's frenetic strumming makes this much more nervy than what's on Seas of Cheese. I feel discombobulated listening to this uh, initial recording of Is It Luck? Uh, and, and Les has said 
uh, many a time that he was pretty cocky back in the day, and he calls Is It Luck one of his cocky songs because he's playing something pretty fancy, um, playing it really fast. So he was he was showing off a little bit there. Todd and Peter are right there with him. Peter playing some cool stuff. And he kind of precipitated Tim's use of the kick drum as yeah. a, a focal point, and you could hear it. Yeah. You could really hear it in that sample. For those of you wondering, the spoken word part is included on the demo version, but it is vastly different. It's normal speaking speed, which is so strange to hear. <laughs> I don't know about, and I think we talked about this, Frankie, on the Is It Luck episode 32 years ago now. I, lo- I really enjoyed slowing it down as, as, as much as I could to try to catch what Les was saying on the Seasons of Cheese recording. Here it is, clear as day. I'll do this. I'll give you guys a little bonus here because uh, Les also asked Peter, if it's luck. And I, I think uh, we should give Peter Libby his flowers for his drum skills. Have a taste of Peter Libby. Yeah. Just to be fully uh, comprehensive. Could you sample the, the coda from the live version, Josh? So, Everyone is familiar with how they modified the track in the early days for its conclusion. No date, 1987. Berkeley. That's all I have to say is where are those comments? Oh, I remember that, yeah. (laughs) She whispered in my ear! There you go. Fantastic Coda. I actually wish they had come up with that by the time they recorded the demo, so it had made the cut. Funky AF. AF Funky. I do wonder <laughs> if it's a tease of of something or if that's original. I'm not entirely certain. Me either. So that is the Welcome to This World demo, 1985 or 6, courtesy of Peter Libby. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, for sending us those tracks. Thanks to Peter Libby for spending an hour talking to us. You will love this talk, guys. Whereas Primate 1984 is fantastic, but it still sounds like Les trying to find his voice, Mm -hmm. um, trying to identify what he wants to do musically. Welcome to this world exudes confidence in all aspects in terms of the rendition, in terms of the vocals, in terms of the lyrics. I mean, I mean, by the time they recorded this group of songs, Les certainly knew what he was doing and the message that he was trying to convey. As you mentioned, I can perfectly envision this tape contributing something uh, in terms of how they began carving their path in the musical scene at the time. It must have been a fantastic memento for anyone that attended one of these early shows. If I had to pick one track, I would say that Riddles is the greatest document of the bunch, simply because of how mind-blowing it is to finally hear what the song sounded like at the time that it was performed by Primus and not by Sausage several years later. Imagine attending a, an early Primus show and they perform Riddles Are Bound Tonight. I, I think that is just crazy. I think uh, the track, my track takeaway is going to be Is It Luck? Because I think it typifies the giddiness, the sweatiness, <laughs> the horniness of uh, those those early live shows. <laughs> 21-year-old dudes up there on stage doing their thing. So I... That's the one I'm going to take away as the uh, emblematic track here. But you're absolutely right. They're much more self-assured, uh, Todd and Les are, uh, on this recording. And I, I think it owes to having a, a solid drummer and Peter Libby bringing it and laying the wood. So they quite a trio they were. And they, they stuck together for a couple of years before Peter moved on. Once again, thank you to Peter for these audio recordings. And please stick around. Enjoy our talk with Peter Libby. 
Later days. Willie Mace. Josh, can I can I please open with first question for Peter? Peter, if if you're game, we'll let Frankie ask the first question. I'm Let's do it. It's not a bad thing. I don't know why I phrased it that way or gave it that tone. It's okay. I'm not, sorry. I it want to put you at ease. Edgy. It makes <laughs> it sound edgy. It's good. Peter, Frankie, wait a second. If, if it's going to be like that, hang on, hang on. <laughs> oh yeah, now we're talking. <laughs> oh <Sorry>. man. <laughs> Yes. There are several, several, several questions I want to ask you, Peter, but the first one is, can you tell us about the photocopier job that you had where Les used to drop by and you guys would print flyers and posters? Did you hold on to any of that stuff? And Oh, no, man. No. <laughs> all of it is gone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that wasn't my... Uh... I wasn't the, the the team librarian. Yeah, <laughs> stuff was floating around. You can find it, but I, I wasn't. I'm not uh, uh, how you say uh, uh, sentimental that way. Uh huh. Yeah, there are a few of those images uh, from uh, from those early days well, still floating club, around. The Mickey Mouse ears. But you were the hookup, Peter. You you worked at the copier place. Is that the idea? Yeah, and um, actually, I was working at the copier place, and so I did all the posters with with Lest. Les would just come in with the artwork. And um, I remember it changed from Primate to Prime Us. And that was like mid 80s. Yeah. Four, maybe 85, 85 86. <laughs> yeah. What, what years were you in Prime Us? Probably 84, 85, 86. And then Curveball was 87. Then Jake came in in 88. He had revolving drummers in 87. A bunch of different guys were trying out. Brain would do a show, Curve would do a show, somebody else would do a show. I think Puffy might even have done a show. <laughs> That's awesome. I remember seeing that, that curveball, and then the next time they came around, some friends of ours, some girls that would go to the city from Santa Rosa all the time, were like had saw him a few more times, and they had gotten Jay Lane in the band. And these girls were raving about how fucking rad Primus is, a bit you know, John the Fisherman, when I grow up, you know, and I was like, all right, I got to see these guys again because they were they were OK. That bass player was good, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so the next time they came around was that time when that you remember. I don't know if you saw it, but remember the Chili Peppers came through. Hillel had passed away and they had Blackbird McKnight from Parliament on guitar and uh, DJ D.H. Peligro from Dead Kennedys on drums. Wow. I didn't see and that it, show. It was Terrible. They played at the Katani Cabaret. Primus came out. It was terrible. Shredded, <laughs> shredded with Jay Lane. Complete waste of like, money. Oh my god, dude! When Jay got in that band, Primus, it like went like ten levels up. We were all just freaking the fuck out. That's always what what Les wanted, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, cool. he's so busy and his patterns are so um, consistent um, that he really needs someone to just stay out of his way. And I think yeah. I was too busy. I was good for the time I was in it, but ultimately I was too busy for that band. Hmm. Let's talk about that. I'm curious your your path into the Bay Area music scene, because one of the great fringe benefits of this podcast is uh, being able to talk to guys who lived it and just understand the magnitude of it all, because just so many names, whether it's bands or individuals, uh, came out of that area. So, uh, so many scenes, too. Yeah. <laughs> It's world beat and funk and rock yeah. and funk and yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> How'd you get into it? Uh, I was born and raised in the Bay Area from a musical background. The oh. family had uh, been listening to jazz since I was in the womb and then moved to the East Bay from San Francisco in eighth grade. And my stepfather was a professional musician. He's a top 40 player. And he had a drummer, Gene Pardue. He's still gigging. He was uh, Eddie Money's drummer. <clears throat> Actually, there's a whole contingent of New York guys. Billy Ryan, he doesn't write, he doesn't play anymore, but great bass player, singer. A uh, bunch of bunch of musicians came through that band. Great singers, drummers. It, Miles Robinson, who is now the and has been the drummer for the Fifth Dimension, was in that band. <laughs> but anyway, Gino Pardue asked me if I wanted to sit his drum set, and I was like 13. And I said sure. Sat down, and like second later, I had a groove going on or well, you know a pattern going on i wouldn't yeah. say it was a groove i'm sure it was <laughs> not but it seemed to come real natural but i didn't think about it again what like six or seven months later there was uh, uh it was christmas 
And it was this big box under the tree. And it was this really cheapo burrito drum set that we rolled the die that they rolled the dice on. My folks rolled yeah. the dice on. And I beat that thing to death. Nice. I just beat it to death. And then I stripped it and painted it and sold it for my birthday. My folk, my uh, stepdad said, so if you really, if you want a new drum set for your birthday, we'll finance a drum set for you, but you got to pay us back. I said, that's a great idea. And they said, okay, well, it's out in the truck. (laughs) I didn't leave that drum set from, you know, like 10th grade um, until I moved out of the house. I don't think I spent much time off it. And my brother's friends, uh, Jeff Weinman, pretty sophisticated music listener drummer he's now a retired music educator in the school of oak in the open school district great guy he would turn us on to fusion so i learned about jean-luc ponty and then you go down the wormhole to different drummers and i found terry bozio and steve smith and and i just found all these really heady players and narda michael walden for christ's sake you know mm-hmm. all these all these monsters coming out of a lot of them out of berkeley and uh, after Primus, I mean, I just started gigging a bunch out of out of high school and out of. Uh, I went to Laney for a little while and tried to do the big band there. Uh, I wasn't very good at that. I it was a little bit too harnessed for me at the time. Um, I got a top forty gig and started playing around the country in a top forty band. I'm not really around the country. About to New Mexico and Pacific Northwest and stuff like that. Picked up some tours. I went to to. Um, Oh, yeah. And then I went to school. I was in a band here called Dawson Tate for three or four years, and we did some touring. That was kind of a a, a vocal rock band. Very, very uh, current at the time. Um, kind of cheesy now, but there was some good stuff there. They sang great. Great band members, good players in the band. And then I left to go to school. I spent two years in L.A., went to Musicians Institute, and got to study with some pretty heady players, uh, Joe Percaro, Jeff's dad, was one of the heads of curriculum. Um, I studied playing techniques. I had to audition for him to get to see what level I went into school. Ralph Humphreys from uh, uh, Frank Zappa, Don Elias Big Band. He was the uh, co-head of curriculum. And the guy I actually went there to study with from Jean-Luc Ponty and Gino Vanelli and jazz and shit was this guy, Casey Shirell. Just burning burning hands on this guy soya you'd shit your pants you <laughs> is that the same guy. school that, that uh, brain went to berkeley yeah he went to he went back east to boston berkeley with two e's oh right okay okay but okay. this is this is like a maybe 10 years before he was there guys like omar hakim were there and steve smith and vinnie caliuta and casey shirell and Ronald Alan dawson and did all the jazz studies there they all they're all degreed all of them yeah it's, yeah it's a freak show Rod Morgenstein. Oh, yeah. And her first, Ripper, lefty. Nard is from there, too. So I study all of those guys. Uh, but Casey was at school, and he was burning. Toss Panos was another one. Uh, Fred Dinkins. So all these guys, you know, you study big band. The big band teacher, Ralph Razzi, he was like the drummer you'd see on stage at Dick Cavett or something like that, right? Oh, like, yeah. Live TV and big bands and shows and stuff. And so he's on camera a lot. In the back of the class, it looks like he's got a full head of hair on him, right? But like, if you're sitting in the front row and he leans over to put a tape or something and to listen to you, notice that his scalp is painted oh. <laughs> up to here. And his hair was all spindly. You know, you would never guess what a fucking axe murderer the guy is on drums. Just so unassuming. He just tears it up like... like so now like how, a how, buddy rich with with more power. Wow. Mm. Pretty terrifying. So now how does all this jazz and big band and fusion background get you into Primus of all bands? Have you listened to that the demo that I sent you? I listened to some of it, yeah. If you listen to the whole thing, I mean, you can hear all of that shit in there. Ah, okay. I'll take a little bit closer now that I know that. You can hear a lot of Terry Bozio and Simon Phillips in there. A lot. Mm-hmm. I quote those guys a lot. Mar- Morgenstein too. A lot of the double bass work, 16th notes accented on the China type, groupings between hands and feet and toms, sets of six or eight or four or five. That's the kind of stuff that I got from those guys. That was the double bass stuff that I liked the most. Cool. Even at that early stage, 
you you were putting that kind of thought uh, into your playing. Oh yeah, I was always a geek about it. You can ask Buzz. <laughs> he knows. You're you're all about the cool jazz bands right now. I like watching your your footage because it's it's so laid back and smooth, man. I get thrown out on the fusion stuff. I never really went down that rabbit hole too deep because I just get it's just I don't know. Some of it is just too fucking noty. Yeah. Um, and, and it sounds um, too self-aware. You know what I mean? <laughs> Self-indulgent. There is that, but you know, some gigs call for that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're playing with some of those LA guys down there, uh, yeah. Brian Matheson's, the Jeff Lorber's of this world, you get the very, very cream of the crop, and people come to see that. Yeah, you go to the baked potato to see Chad Wackerman on a Friday night in a room right. with forty people. Right. Yeah. You know? It, and it, and it becomes an art, but the guy, there's a lot of stuff you see on TV where it's just such a fucking come spray note fest tornado of bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it uh, it turns me off too. I think the farthest I I got into it would be Al Di Miolo with Steve Gadd that era. I mean, so, I, I know other guitar friends who say the same thing. I, I kind of mm-hmm. dug it because it was my first experience with lightning fast fusion mm-hmm. as guitar guy. Well, you see, I had played with Bob Coons. So I knew about Lightning Fast. Did you know Bob? Uh-uh. No way. Oh, my God. He's still out there. He was like, he was a local guy. Me and Ed Malaga and Brian Kehoe yeah. were in a band um, when I was just out of high school. We had a fusion band in my basement. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was crazy. And Bob Coons was there. And he was this guy out of, like, Piedmont. And he was, I think he's on the spectrum, you know, um, now he works in computer science, but he still shows up at a gig every once in a while. And it's like somebody gave Alan Holdsworth speed and just pushed him on stage. He grabs his, his volume knob, he whips it on and he just, it's pretty amazing. (laughs) Well, the spray of notes from the guy. Well, I gotta say for me, after seeing that show with curveball and being extremely unimpressed with curveballs drumming up against Les's freak out bass playing. When we saw the the band again and Jay was there, it was just like like there was a fusion dude that was funk that got in there and it just made sense, you know? Well that's Jay though, you know. And, but I and I I never saw it with you. And I, I never really listened to any of the stuff with you until some of these demos kind of surfaced here and there. But you know, by then it was like whatever. I mean it's just yeah. super cool versions of what they turned it into, you know. How many of those songs do they still do or did Primus touch upon later on? Because I, I really didn't follow the all band. Of them, much, all yeah. of them, pretty much. With them? Name them, because Welcome to This yeah. World is one of them, right? Yep. Yeah. The Five yeah. Lost of Tradition has stuck yeah. around. Uh, the Pressman has also always been a staple. Everything has pretty much remained. Is it Luck? Oh, is yeah. it Luck? It's also a fan favorite. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. That. That Peter, uh, recorded version of that made it onto a bumper on the Howard Stern show for years, actually. Really? Oh, yeah. Lur, Lur was stoked because he was such a Howard Stern fanatic. And then he started getting paychecks <laughs> for their song being like a 10 second bumper every day. That was kind of wow, funny. that's great. Well, yeah. good for them. 10 seconds on national TV or international TV will get you paid, man. I have a buddy who, uh, He's an old shredder out of San Francisco, out of the Sierra Foothold Hills. But I met him when he lived in San Francisco. He was a Joe Satriani student, like so many others. But uh, he really, really, he really, really took it far. Um, and he's got a couple of bumpers on ESPN and, and things like that. Shred bumpers, you know, you hear mm-hmm. going into yeah. the next thing. Some, of them, eh, some crazy Randy Rhodes thing going on. That's right. It might well be him. <laughs> and he's been making money off that shit forever. Yeah, God, dude, we victims family somehow unbeknownst to us, uh, Carson Daly show. Uh huh. There's one, one of those talk shows down south, might have been Ellen DeGeneres. Who, one of them had a DJ up in the seats that would like spin records. There was like no house. Yeah, band. I remember that. I, I can't remember if it was Ellen or if it was Carson Daly. For some weird reason, that DJ played a victim's family song for eight seconds on an out bumper, right? To a commercial. Nice. So all of a sudden we get the notice from BMI and like all three of us got like 850 bucks. Damn. For eight yeah. seconds on national TV. We were like, Oh fuck, that's rad. Dude, but they only did it that one time, you know, just the dude randomly played a part of one of our songs. It's trippy. Wow. Yeah. So I can't that's imagine if you're like Cheryl Crow and you're on every goddamn radio station around the world and TV show all fucking day, every day, you know? 
can't imagine the money that comes in. Oh my God. <laughs> got to put our ki- more kids through college. Got to put my grandkids through college. You know? Yeah. At this yeah. point, I know guys that have bought houses on a teaching practice and gigging and, you know, getting a bumper like that. I remember back in the in the mid 90s, remember when Limbo's kind of fell, fell apart, Pete Scatero moved to L.A. and he started getting into the, you know, the movie and TV music thing. And all of a sudden one day I remember watching this TV and a Circuit City commercial came up and it was a flat out fucking ripoff of Helmet unsung, you know, <laughs> and they like and it found out it was Merv and Pete and House. Because he flew those guys down there and they got hired by some agency to make bumper songs that were just like popular songs at that moment. Oh. And so we Scandal. ended up we ended up getting out on the punch bowl tour and, and and Les was all fired up because Helmet was the opening band, right? And it came up and and Paige Hamilton was like, Man, you know, you see that Circuit City commercial and Les like, dude, those are my friends, man. I'd I'd sue those guys, man. Sue that corporation. And that, like like Mervin. Those guys aren't going to get sued, but that silly company is, man, I'd go after those guys and get some cash out of that. But she never did, but it was just really funny that that they would just change the hook a little bit. You know? <laughs> it would be the same song. You know, it's not unusual. You hear it oh, a lot. Of course not, yeah. Um, when I was going to school, I was doing a um, cartage, studio cartage for guitar players. I worked for Andy Brower. We would move guys like um, Robin Ford and Carl Verheyen and Mike Landau, Tim Pierce. Mm. And Dean Parks, Dean Parks plays all the movies and all the TV shows and all the jingles. And he's in the pit at the Oscars and he's in the pit at the Grammys back in the day when they had like, a you know, a big band, oh, big band. Yeah, he's the busiest. He's the busiest guy. And we've moved him into studios and heard him play a couple of cues. And you can tell, like, it's a couple of notes different or maybe yeah. it's slight minor key but it's the girl from Impanima. Yeah, yeah. Right, things like that because the music is supposed to be you know, a bar band. Right. Uh, a jazz lounge or something while people are are having drinks and talking in the movie. So but they can't, they don't want to pay the royalties. But they pay that motherfucker triple scale <laughs> to do it. They don't sound kind of like other songs that everybody will kind of recognize yeah. or they will yeah. yeah. Hey, that what is that song and then it's you know, like 30 seconds of it. I actually wanted to, I was going to ask you this uh, a bit later on, but since you mentioned uh, PC drumming and, you know, filling every space with a lot of notes, I wanted to ask you how hard it was for you to become a sparse drummer, to learn how to serve songs instead of trying to fill as much space as possible. Work in progress. Better have had it than other times. When I say too busy, that's in hindsight. It was the, I was playing the right stuff. I was leaving the space for for less. You know, I was building my patterns off of what he was playing. You know, the band just evolved. I guess mm-hmm. I was the right drummer at the time. I mean, I was in there for three years, right? If I wasn't the right drummer, it would have been. I wouldn't have been there. Less is notoriously hard on drummers. You know, it's 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 hard not to be critical of yourself, and you need to be somewhat critical. I'm my own worst enemy a lot of the time when it comes to accepting or accepting that you actually might be good. Hmm. I didn't listen to that demo for, I hadn't heard it for 10 years. And then uh, Todd came through with it and, and said, Hey man, here you go. You're on this. Take it. You know, I wasn't able to share it or play it for people unless they were at my house. Right. And so recently I called him up and asked him if he'd made any forward motion on that stuff. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, so I'm going to change the parameters of this thing. And now you can do whatever you want with it. So I felt a little bit, you know, I'm still trying to be judicious, but yeah, now I can, I can actually share it a little bit. Have you talked to Les about it? You guys ever revisit no. it together? I, I haven't seen Les since I got out of the band. Well, I mean, wow. I bumped into him here and there. Right. But, um, you know, he lives in Sebastopol. I was I was curious, Peter, if you kept up with Primus in the sense that you've heard the albums as they've come out, or you've actually kept track of you know all the stuff they've done ever since. There was no acrimony. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm sure Les would would be tickled pink to to run into me somewhere, um, mm-hmm. but he's got a very busy life, and you know I would be t- I, he'd be in my house if he was here. He'd yeah. be welcome in my house anytime. It'd be fascinating to see him. 
I'm really proud of him and impressed with Les Claypool and what he's created. It's pretty fucking amazing what that man has created. Yeah. Really. Do you have any favorite tracks or albums that you enjoy listening to? Nah. No, not at all. I'm curious about that idea of you you're being your own worst critic and then coming back around to this to this music that you were a part of. I, I assume at a fairly young age. How old were you when you when you joined up and or actually how old were you when you got into the scene and started drumming and then and then eventually uh, hooked up with Les and Todd? I was in my teens when I was I was already in the scene. When I graduated from high school, I immediately the bands that I were in were starting to play, play, you know, downstairs at the the comeback in what we called the scumbag in up on Durant in Berkeley. Some of my father's friends and musicians, people he worked with, were um, giving me opportunities to play with older musicians and professional musicians, non-scene musicians. That's why I didn't, I wasn't really big in the scene because I was in a different scene. I was. Mm-hmm. I was in uh, gigging bands, working bands, blue collar, paying for my groceries by by playing. You know that really kind of solidifies your 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 groove and your time and and your ability to to play uh, relaxed because you're doing five sets five nights a week. Wow! Or every week of the year, that's a lot of hours to sit in the pocket on tunes and having to recreate stuff. It gives you a, a very broad vocabulary but it's not in the scene you don't really have time for projects that don't get some gas in your car yeah yeah <laughs> and there are plenty of those out there especially with uh you know in those early days because you know soya has told us even before soya got hooked into these guys you know talking about how primus or primate was playing for 10 people you know in a room eventually became 30 but it, it took a while and then they were playing for three you know two three hundred but it took a while to get there but that's a lot Dude, of, i have a great story yeah. about that oh please oh my god i think uh, i think the club was called buzz what, top of the hill in oakland and they were doing rock shows and they were doing punk shows and stuff like that and primus went up there second gig you know we played them a buhe and stuff like that right yep. but playing at uh, uh this joint we started our set and we we're like two songs in, two and a half songs in. And the club owner, he comes out and he says, excuse me, excuse me. We, I think there's been some sort of mistake. You guys, you guys stop playing. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> That's great. Booted us. Didn't even get halfway into the sets. And you guys wow. you suck. Oh. So now, now those are, those are your first gigs with Primus. So was there a live drummer before you in Primus that played actual yeah, gigs? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, was the drum so the first uh the first album that has the baby suck on this i believe mm-hmm. you turn that over on the back and there's a special hugs and kisses those are all the drummers yeah kern was one of the guys kern kern, right. the kern, 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 the kern the watch him burn he yep. was the he was the first guy and mark Bean, Bean, right? was another guy who uh was in the band yep. before me but it wasn't primus then it was primate mark edgar is a great drummer uh, I don't know if he's around. He's trying to look up Mark cool. and Kern. I don't remember his name, but it is on the back of Suck on This. Yeah, he passed away. Yeah, Brett Kern. Yeah, he that... passed. Brett Kern. I met him Brett. a couple times. Like any, I think he yeah, was, he was a around, good guy. I met him a couple of times. He was too. up around Eugene or somewhere up in the Northwest, and and he'd come out every time we'd come around with any of Les's bands, and Les would just always open his heart to that dude. You go, look, right, so I'm going to be here. Kern, Everybody just fucking deal with him for a half hour. It's my buddy. Just deal with it. And, you know, he talked a lot. And he was like Primus' biggest fan ever. And it was funny and fun, but whatever. Bummer the guy passed yeah, away. See. Him and Les and uh, uh, Mark Edgar and all those guys and Andy and Kehoe and the guys and Kirk. I don't remember James, but I had the bass player, I think I remember, from El Sobrante and Les. All those guys, they were just all the high school guys. Yeah. They were the... The northern, the north, the northeastern quadrant of the Bay Area's rock and roll guys. Leonard Skinner meets yeah. Parliament Funkadelic, you know. <laughs> so tell me this. When you started in Primus, playing the drums, recording the demos, doing shows, was Les still doing Tommy Crank Band at that same time? Or did he? Wow, that- yeah, he was doing Tommy Crank gigs. That band fucking smoked. Did you ever yeah. see him? I met him one time. He came, he came to a Primus show or some show. I don't remember where the hell we were. 
big dude with a big beard and a big woman with him. And, and Les is like, so I had this fucking Tommy fucking crank right there. And I was like, <laughs> no way. <laughs> hey, yeah. Uh, I saw him when he wasn't fat. But yeah. yeah, Tommy Crank Band, I saw them once. Les had short hair. He had the like flat top and fenders, right? Yeah. Um, and he's still playing to Carl Thompson. Yeah. But man, when he was sitting in the pocket, he was a mug. Really? So that's where he learned it all was from Tommy Crank. That yep. really yep. got him in the path that he went to. You know, it's funny when I was the standing there. Dollar gigs, man, when you got to do gig and gig and gig and gig yeah. and gig. When yeah. I was standing there talking to Tommy Crank and his wife, I, I assume it was his wife. You know, we were chit chatting on it's just like, yeah, man, I've heard about you guys for blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, you guys got to know Les gives you Tommy Crank credit for like his whole beginnings in music. He's like, really? No, really? He still I'm like, dude, you can find any interview where he talks about his beginnings and Tommy Crank and the Tommy Crank band will come into the interview. Right. Mm -hmm. Frankie, no. you, I'm sure you've heard Tommy Crank mentioned many, many times. And he was really honored by that. Yes. Us, you know? It's kind of cool. You know, there's always those guys, you know, that it, in that that gave you the leg up. If that was the direction you wanted to go, yeah. Um, the the guys that my uh, my dad inter inter uh, introduced me to uh, a bunch of guys out of Arcata, they and they were at a music school, College of the Redwoods. They all went to music school up there. Mm -hmm. Those guys were great mentors. I had a regular gig. I was the house drummer at Eli's Mile High Club hmm. for a couple of years. And I got a bunch of blues gigs out of that and did some blues touring. I just played Eli's for the first time ever. When? Like last January, we did the little tour with Victim's Family and Gibby Haynes from the Butthole Surfers. Man. And that was the, that was the Bay Area. Tell me when that shit's coming up. Man, that's like Dude, I mean, that place only half holds, of my house. That place only holds like 200 people. There was like 300 people on there. So Dude. what? I know. I'm just saying. I, I I was like, whoa, what the? Why are we playing this little dinky foot? It was packed. It was great. <laughs> it was a great show, right? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, and some of the, the my best shoulder, shows I ever played were like at the Berkeley Square where you couldn't move. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Primus yeah. opened for the Red Hot Chili Peppers on their first album. They just came up from L.A. Halil Slovak and Jack Irons. Yep. We opened for those guys, and the man, it's like the walls were dripping sweat. It was so thick in there. It was a total fire hazard, but man, a fire it hazard. ripped it to pieces. The yeah. chills were so terrifying to watch. Yeah. <laughs> they were so good then. It was on fire, man. It was amazing. Well, I'm to pick up on that thread, I'm interested in what you learned from, obviously from gigging with Primus, but also by being around these bands like the Chili Peppers that would come up from L.A., especially considering you, you went um, in a different direction musically, more or less. Back into the fucking practice shed you go at another <laughs> night a week. Um, you, don't want, you can't go to L.A. You can't play in L.A. Seeing guys, the bands that were on the strip, like um what what are they called uh motley crew would come up here mm -hmm. and those guys tore it to shreds too yeah every time the band came up from la you know i would try and go and check out the la guys a lot of people did and you would just have your mind blown by how polished they were and how comfortable on stage hmm. their execution um you know everybody meant it i mean these guys probably lived in their rehearsal studio and played every day right yeah. that's probably yeah. all they did so and it showed it's terrifying think about having guys like that open for you right oh, man wow <laughs> that's <laughs> some serious ball sweat right there <laughs> so when you're opening for these bands coming up from la and you see the peppers or fishbone up close and you go this is coming out of la holy crap Ola. Yeah, i fishbone. guess yeah you, you wouldn't have a prayer right so you got to go practice. oh yeah no there was bands that had a prayer but you know there were few and far between and down there, status quo. So yeah, there's bands up here that could compare for sure. Um, but you know, it's like that I now when you go to LA and go to the clubs. It's it's scary as fuck to go to LA. And I was just down there a week and a half ago for the Nam show and hanging out with a buddy of mine who's a, a working pro down there. Every bar has oh yeah that guy's with Streisand and uh, oh yeah and that guy's touring with Kenny Loggins and uh, oh yeah and that's the session player for that TV show and blah 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 and, you know they're rubbing elbows at the bar it's the cream of the musical crop in the United States and and they're <laughs> having beers and playing a bar gig or a restaurant gig yeah I think that Les and Primus definitely brought that funk explosion 
into light in the Bay Area. And then the Bay Area versions of it that spun out of Primus Limbos and Fungal Mungo and all that shit was pretty unique to up here, you know? It was. Up. It was its own scene. Kind of took it all, took a little bit off of this and that, Fishbone mostly, you know, and a little bit of the Chili Peppers. And I, I think it was just like its own scene up here, man. I don't know. I think the, the LA album hadn't even come out when Les was writing. Yeah, it was his own bag. A lot of these yeah. guys are, are older than you, than that, and so I don't know that I necessarily agree that they grabbed from those guys. It was just the time and the the the, the results of the information that people were getting. Yeah, you know, and you get it there and you get it here, but they get a different flavor down there because you got more Latin influence down there, maybe. Mm -hmm. So they get a slightly different thing. Like the chilies have that Latin influence in them somehow, right? You can just yeah. kind of feel there's a little bit of extra spice there that you don't find in the northern climes. And then up here, you got a different bag. So it's just a regional bag, if you will. Yeah. But you're all still hearing some of the same musics. Mom. But, you know. hmm. What's the big takeaway from from your time in the in the Bay Area scene with Primus or around, aside from practice 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 which makes perfect sense oh. but what was what was a major takeaway for you uh musically as you uh made your way uh into that world the first word that comes to mind is diversity mm. the diversity of the scene here yeah um you know you go to oakland and you get funk and blues you go to the lake you start to get R and B and jazz and the Kanzaki Lounge and the guys that are reading and doing big bands and you and you're in Berkeley, you get something else. You go to San Francisco, my God, so you got world beat and mm -hmm. and people listening to Chuck Brown and doing go go. I, you had to be able to play every goddamn thing in the world if you wanted to to work and be someone that actually you know gets paid for a gig, picking up bands. Um, I, there was money to be made, there was gigs to be had, and it was just a really diverse scene. I toured Europe five times with Matt Callahan from the Looters. You remember him, Buzz? Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. We did. He did two albums when I was in the band, and we went to like eight countries in Europe. And this was world beat gospel, so it was like gospel vocals with R and B and out euro afro flavors in it and they wow. ate that shit with a spoon in europe we <laughs> just loved it right Dude. and that was a mishmash of all these disparate types of music that i may not have listened to until i heard that band the next thing you know rhythm of the saints comes out and paul simon's got african musicians in his yeah. band yeah graceland so, too is pretty funky yeah graceland too what i learned was that it really paid to have a diverse vocabulary and a diverse skill set and able to play different styles at different volumes and different dynamics and speeds and what have you. That's something that you can get with a formal education, but it just seems like the experience in that area, even more educational than being in a classroom. Like, for example, I'm a, I'm a school teacher and I learned more in my first month actually teaching in a classroom than I did in the year of teaching school, right? Mm -hmm. So it just that practical experience is everything, it seems. You learn the vocabulary in school. You got to talk to people out of school. That's a great way to put it. Right? Yeah, I touched upon big bands and uh, odd meters and jazz and latin and rock and sight reading and, and all this and playing techniques and artificial groupings and baloney god god go go but when i got out of school it was just a mishmash in you and you got to go out and play um everything you can't expect to be able to speak eloquently um we were talking about busy musicians. When you first get out of school, you're just all full of words. Yeah. Use five words to when you could use two or one, right? And then you start learning about the guys. They get paid, the, the Jeff Percaros, the Steve Gads, the Jim Keltners of this world that are getting paid 1050 for three hours twice a day every week. They really make some money doing this. And 
it's because they are conversant in so many styles, truly conversant. They're like polyglots, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody that's like my stepdaughter, she speaks four languages now wow. um, besides English. So five languages and she's just piling them on. She can go anywhere. She has this versatility. That's what you need. You just need to be versatile. That's what I get when I, when I was playing here a lot. Wow. And then, and then you go to a victim's family show, and that's a completely different world. But and and you've referred to Soya as Buzz a couple times. Can you elaborate on that uh, <laughs> for us? Because that's a great nickname. Uh, Ever seen his hands when he plays? I have actually gotten to see Victim's Family play, and it was would shot the motherfucker right there, man. The first time you saw us was we opened for Primus at the Omni. And what did I say? I walked off carrying my shit. And you're like, dude, you're like a fucking buzz off there, dude. What the fuck was that, man? <laughs> Holy shit. And I'm just like, I don't know, dude. Just trying to fucking play as fast as I can, man. <laughs> Boom. That was fun. Fun times, man. What the hell is up with that? You know, you have, you resemble Travis Barker. Yeah, he's same as me. He came up in marching band. Right. Band. That's how, yeah, you, you resemble Travis. That's where I kind of got all that from. Straight back and playing off. Playing off the drum, yeah, speaking, yeah, buzz. Yeah, it was kind of funny because I was the Primus roadie there for a year. You know, when Jay was ending, Jay and Todd were ending, and then those guys never saw Victim's Family. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, Les is like, "Hey, man, Victim's Family, I remember that band? Do you guys want to play a show? We're doing the Omni." I'm like, "Yeah, dude, let, we'll do that." And at the Omni, member, everyone would stand on the right side there at the top of the staircase, and it's like you and Flapjacks and Mike Borden and. Lur and right. like everybody are lined up and we just fucking tore at it and everybody there just kind of went what a great scene that was huh what the fuck who where the what, what are you doing setting up fucking drums you should be the drummer every fucking night dude i'm like i don't know I'm just trying to help out man <laughs> play drums and help out Fun so time. here's got some really nice hands on him pretty impressive and you I'll played a really minimal kit right you just had a snare yep. drum a kick and maybe a ride cymbal no i used the hi-hat for the ride and one crash yeah, man. Same as always. And so everyone could see how badass his hands were. They weren't <laughs> scared by drums. That's right. <laughs> Hold on. I have a video. I think I could show it. You have very you... different hands, you and me. Cool. I didn't study jazz. I didn't shit. I had hands before I went to school. It's I'm talking pure technique. Hmm. You know, yeah. it's just very different approaches, and they're both equally effective. It's trippy, man. Dude. The way everybody learns what they do, you know. I mean, I came up in marching band, and then I got into heavy metal when it first started coming on megadeth and perfect death and just that was all i wanted was to be faster and faster and faster and faster you know you know donnie green i do not he's a south bay drummer he was a metal drummer back in the day um and uh now he's he's a working guy down there um god he used to play a bunch of metal you would love his playing um He's uh he's not a marching guy, but man, he he could be. Yeah, hmm. sits up straight, plays on top of his drums. Got yeah, a my lot. Favorite was, my favorite a lot was always uh, the Gar Samuelson played with Megadeth. Mm -hmm. Their first two records, and he was a jazz guy, so he brought this kooky swing, kind of like how Dave Lombardo brings the swing to Slayer that mm -hmm. nobody else can seem to do. But Gar was the same thing, and he was he was fuck just do this crazy weird shit, and I was like, man, that's. And so when I got in Victims Family. You know, influenced by Primus, being around us all the time. It's like always trying to go in the, in some completely bizarre direction was the goal. You know, to not right. be okay. We're a we're a metal band or we're a funk band. It was like no, we're all of that. At any given moment, we're going to turn directions and do a little bit of everything in every song. You know, it was kind of like that. And that's yeah. kind of how the scene unfolded like that. You know, in those in the late eighties. You know, like Laurel Pine up in, you know, Sonoma County would do shows with Mr. Bungle and Firehose and Primus would be all one show, you know, and then be like these crazy bills. It was so fucking fun, man. Peter, can I please ask you a question about sure. Emeryville, um, the warehouse mm -hmm. where you guys would rehearse? Did you rehearse songs that were, you know, that already existed or did you actually come out with songs after jamming there? What was the dynamic when you guys would go to that warehouse? Because he was writing the lyrics, he would have a book of lyrics with him always. You know, he's always jotting down notes and lyrics. Um, and he would put them over his bass parts. He would come in with a bass part. And, yeah, he didn't really have recordings for stuff. I think I might have heard two or three songs on a tape 
with Kern or Mark Edgar. But after that, we had a lot of material. (laughs) We were doing a lot of songs, so we definitely wrote together. But it was mostly Todd and Les. And then I would find, you know, I'm the drummer. I would do, I would find the right way to support, enhance, whatever. This is kind of a long shot, Peter. um, But I was hoping you could clear up this because it has been a mystery for us for a very long time. So you played drums on Riddles Are Abound Tonight, the demo version from Mm -hmm. the, the demo tape. But did that song ever get performed live while Every you night. were in the band? Every night. Yeah. So it was a regular in the set list. Yeah. Great. We, we were not sure because there is no record of that song being performed live back then. But thank you so much for confirming that it actually made it to the shows. Yeah, it's, oh, actually sure. tri- it's actually trippy that that all the pre Lay 1988 moment, like s- there's songs that, have, that were involved back then but like the pretty much the gamut of a lot of that stuff kind of got shelved and like spoon fed into primacy albums like later, you know, like riddles obviously never went to primus. Here's to the man. There's like a bunch of those tunes you were playing. But when Les got to that mm-hmm. suck on this point after the sausage demo, he just went, okay, all the stuff we're going to wait on that. Cause I'm, we're going to focus right here. And even when Jay was in the band, there was a lot of those, those old songs that you were playing, he, they didn't bring it with Jay. Definitely not Riddles. I never heard that until I heard the you know, sauce. I mean, you listen to to that demo, that five song demo, and it's it's pretty. It seems really different to me than anything that I heard from them afterwards. The stuff that he wrote after that stuff, yeah. you know. Because Welcome to This World came out in '92 on Pork Soda, like so. That's like almost ten years later. He pulled that one out of his yeah. hat, you know, brought like, it back around, yeah. Brought it back around. Same as, you know, Pressman was on Suck On This, was one of the older. Like I thought five Pressman years later? Was new. I was out of the band, well, you know, so I was out of the band in 87 or 88, somewhere in there. So that's only like five years, six years later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean. And 92 is the year that I went to L.A. to go to M.I. Right. When Jay was in the band, though, in 88 into 89, when I was okay. the roadie dude, the set list was pretty much. There and was only like, did like two or three gigs, you know. He was never the right guy for that, so he didn't last. Yeah, but it was like the set list was pretty much ten songs, and the, and he wasn't pulling older tunes out to try to get them because all of a sudden the J thing fell apart, and Les just said, "Okay, Why? just because he he was in the Freakies and he wanted to bail, so he started mm-hmm. fucking around." And Les is like, "Dude, you either got to be in my band or you go be in the Freakies." But you I know, ran him a couple of times recently, at Yoshi's. Yoshi. He actually invited me up to to Les's birthday party, but I couldn't get away. Is there a recording of that anywhere? I'll have to, I'll have to dig it up. I'll text, text it to you. But yeah, Brandon please. called me the next morning, just freaking the fuck out, you know, because Vinny's really? his favorite. You know, like, that's his absolute Our favorite. No, Vinny's been my favorite. Yeah. I have a... yeah. Brain's just like, dude, I, I can't even describe to you what the fuck was just going on, dude. He's like, he's back there right before they're playing, and I hear this fucking machine gun going off. I'm like, what the fuck? And I look around the corner in the back of that club. And there's Vinny on an anvil plastic drum road case going, what? Probably he's like, you do a second ago. Yeah, <laughs> man. He's like, it was fucking <laughs> scary, man. I didn't know what to do. I was freaking out. <laughs> yeah. I was, uh, I saw Zappa in 78 at the Berkeley Community Theater. Um, and it was Vinny's first tour with him. And I had gone expecting to see uh, uh, Terry Bozio. Uh-huh. So I was really disappointed when I saw the drum set because it clearly wasn't Terry. Then Vinny starts playing, and it's you know he's a he was a freak then, right? He was a freak. He's still a freak. And uh, they introduced him, and then they they put that on the Tinseltown Rebellion album. You can hear me whistle a high whistle when they introduced Vinny. <laughs> nice, nice. nice. I got a whistle on the album. Yeah, because when when Brain went to Berkeley, the you know Ralph Humphreys was the dude, right? He was. He was who you had to do your your when Brain went to MI. MI. Sorry. Right. That dude was there. He was the dude that Brain had to do his uh thesis, like the final, to, to mm-hmm. graduate. You know, you had to do something. So Brain transcribed the black page and played it for Ralph. <laughs> right. And Brain said that you might have mentioned that Brain's transcription is in the MI book. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, so Brain says that. 
He transcribed that shit. Ralph Humphreys was blown away because five out of 10 dudes try to do the black page and fail miserably, right? Like they want to do it. Right. Ralph Humphreys told Brain it was the closest that anybody had ever got to transcribing it correctly without uh-huh. looking at Frank's sheets. And when Brain played it, Ralph said, that's the closest anybody has ever come to playing it correctly outside of Terry Bozio in Baby Snakes, you know, or whatever that moment, you know. Brain was I, like, I didn't even know what it was. Brain never let on, man. You just didn't know with that guy what he was so uh, uh, self effacing, if you will. He didn't lord his abilities on anybody. You know, I mean, he was nutty and wacky and all that stuff, yeah. but he was so well rounded, such a monster. Yeah. Um, it really was something. I had a lot of respect for, for Brain. Josh. <laughs> uh, Frankie, are you guys familiar with the black page? Do you know? What yeah, it's oh, insane. Yeah. That okay. thing is crazy. Yeah. I Have you know. ever seen the, the um, Vinny talk about his audition when he talks? Of, um, he, uh, you know, he gets he gets the cattle call or he goes to a cattle call. Guys are dropping like flies, right? They get up there for a couple of seconds. And, and it's notoriously difficult and unforgiving. Um, and they've got two drum sets set up. So one guy is setting up this uh, this gigantic kit while the other guy's auditioning and they go through drummers and they're lasting about 15 seconds each <laughs> and um then he gets up there frank is putting down sheet music and stuff like that and asking to play this and asking to play reggae and in, in 19 okay now solo in 19 okay now half time in 19 okay now you know and he's just throwing this shit at him and then he puts the black page in front of him but like a lot of guys uh, in that era, myself included, and the guys in that main brain, he's already looked at it a lot. So he knows it by heart. And so Frank notices that he's not looking at it and he's playing it. <laughs> he says, oh, you think you're smart. So he pulls it off the stand and he puts something else on there called Pedro's Diary, Dowry. And it's just as dense, just as difficult and he go, he lays down the paper and he goes, one, two, three, four. And that's all you get, right? <laughs> he hired him. Said, I gotta listen to a couple more guys, but I don't believe that anyone else is going to be able to play better than you. So would you wait over there? Wow. <laughs> wow. I'll put on Julie. Even London. back in the day, you know, it's like my influences were were, and that was to you, Josh. Like yeah. my influences were were that. So um when and I grew up listening to Jazz was playing in my house nonstop, so I'm listening to guys like Tony Williams, yep, and Jack DeJanet and and Max Roach. And these guys were the technicians, the burning, cutting edge technicians of their time. People are still quoting yeah. uh, uh, Tony Williams to this day. Yes, uh, ask, ask anyone. Growing up and hearing that stuff and having that be my base of information, even before I played drums, my my ear was more sophisticated yeah uh, more attuned to a, a a less formulaic approach yeah and that's i i can tell you the first time i heard tony williams it just blew me away he what a powerhouse what an incredible drummer he you know buddy everyone talks about buddy rich and buddy rich is to be lauded and, and he fucking impressive but the next guy that had that kind of influence is Tony Williams. Bunny's Buddy's generations, the 50 years before that, the great the jazz age, the guys that came up through there, he was the guy. And then Tony was the guy, you know, and I don't know who it is now. For a while, for a long time there, it was Vinny. Vinny was the guy. Mm-hmm. And now there's Gergo Bor- Berloy and people like that who are, and uh, what's his name? Mike Mangini and, yeah, and people that are the guy that are that have a, a direction a, a different branch of the tree that starts perhaps dennis chambers is a great guy to yep. you the trunk of the drum tree and then you have little off sprouts so you have big branches right big branches like buddy rich big branches like tony williams big branches like neil pert mm-hmm. john bonham these guys are all big branches. And then from those big branches, you get smaller branches like Buzz or myself and people that listen to those guys. And now the guys that took 
the guys on those branches that are still growing, they're the ones that are influencing the next Spriggs. Thomas Lang and who's the, 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 yeah, the, Thomas the, Lang, Mike Mangini. Yeah. You know, these guys are are are. But like, you really hear someone like um, like Dennis Chambers, the whole gospel chops movement is yep. offshoot of the Dennis Chambers branch. Yeah, I wasn't uh, aware of that, and and brain and and less even pointed that out to me when I'd be like, oh my god that dude's fucking ripping up some new shit. They're like, dude, go listen to some Dennis Chambers. That dude just stole all that shit from Dennis Chambers. <laughs> all, of it, <laughs> all of it. And they only stole one part, you know? <laughs> the paradiddle combinations orchestrated around the kit. You yeah. could do it really fast. Yeah. You know? uh, um, but they all sound the same to me. And yeah, they've got time and, and they've got groove and vocabulary, but the thing that's making it onto YouTube is that, is the Gospel Chops bag. Peter... Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and share all of these incredible anecdotes. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, this actually has been quite educational for me. And I there's some names that were familiar, some that were not. I'm not a drummer by any means, but I love w watching drummers and learning from them. So I, I appreciate that. And of course, thank you for taking us down memory lane with your, your primus. Oh, you're welcome. In the Bay. I never get to do that. So that was fun. Excellent. Thank you so much.